And uh, thanks for the invitation to present here today. And thanks to all of you for coming along and for contributing uh, to this really excellent event. Um, I'm going to talk today about um, how researchers can use publicly available observational data to inform health policy. And in order to sort of uh, give a bit of dramatic effect to my talk, I'm going to suggest that there's an elephant in the room. Okay? It's not a very big elephant, but there's, there is an elephant there indeed, and I'm going to uh, speak a little bit more about that. Uh, in a couple of moments' time. In terms of the sort of the very broad context for what I'm going to talk about today, um, that broad context is the variety and the large number of public and population health challenges that we face, so challenges in relation to obesity, diabetes, mental health, heart disease, and many, many others. And within that context, I think there's a very important role for researchers, because many of us as researchers take our research questions and the issues and topics that we analyse were informed by these societal challenges. And what we look to do when we undertake research projects is we like to, or we look to develop evidence uh, to inform policymakers and provide information and, um, and evidence so that policymakers can make better informed decisions. So very much within the spirit, I suppose, of evidence-based policy. And those of us who work in the health domain, um, who do quantitative research in the health domain, we're very fortunate that we have a wide range of really high quality observational data sets. And by observational data sets, I mean non-experimental data sets. And these observational data sets are generally publicly available and sometimes freely available, and they include wonderful resources like the Growing Up in Ireland survey data, TILDA, Sloan. Sometimes we're fortunate enough to get access to observational data from hospital records, administrative data, census data, and so on. So it's that availability of observational data within the context of these population, societal population health challenges that's going to inform my talk today. And obviously in a lot of these sorts of projects that we're involved in, we often tend to take an interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary approach to considering these issues. But invariably, individual disciplines and individual areas like, for example, health economics will have specific questions that we're interested in addressing and will give um, additional insights. So health economics is no different to all the other uh, areas in that um, it provides a useful lens to consider alternative questions to deliver alternative insights. And just very quickly, um, what I would argue that health economics offers, it offers both theoretical and empirical contributions to, um, uh, to think about these topics. So very, very briefly, at a sort of at a theoretical level, health economics provides a framework for exploring human behavior. So many of the, the students here that I see today will be very familiar with, say, for example, the Grossman model. Um, it also usefully presents a rationale or theoretical rationale for public policy intervention. So to help policymakers to make informed decisions, particularly when there are competing demands on resources and those resources are constraints. But as well as the sort of the theoretical uh, frameworks and the rationales, there's also a range of empirical methods with, that are regularly used within health economics um, that can be useful in terms of estimating quantitative and qualitative relationships but also for evaluating public policy interventions. And it's those empirical methods that I would like to talk about today. And in particular, what I want to talk about is the usefulness of applied health econometrics within that sort of broader context uh, that I've introduced. So applied health econometrics, as again, my many students in the room will, will, uh, will obviously know, are the range of methods that are available, statistical methods, that we use to estimate relationships between health variables of interest. So many of the methods that we use have much in common with biostatistic, biostatistical analysis, epidemiological techniques, and techniques that are used in other domains. But what differs, I think, for in terms of, or one of the things, I think, that uh, sets health econometrics apart from these other, um, from these other uh, approaches would be the types of questions that we tend to ask, and also then the types of variables that we're interested in modeling. So for example, Typically, in, a, in an applied health econometric research project, we might be interested in modeling some dependent variable of interest like, well, it could be a health outcome, but it could be something like resource use, economic costs, or some socioeconomic outcome. Um, on the right-hand side of the equation, in terms of the independent variables, the sort of variables that we're interested maybe 
in thinking about as explanatory variables, we're often interested in looking at you know, whether or not there are socioeconomic disparities or gradients in terms of some of these, um, these outcome measures. Um, we're often interested in the extent to which an individual's insurance status might impact on things like resource use or even health outcomes. And obviously we often then will have health variables on the, the sort of the right hand side of that equation as a, as a predictor or an explanatory variable in terms of looking at how that might be related to, to some of these outcomes. So what I'm going to do today in my presentation is I'm going to talk about how this area um, or these sets of techniques um, that we use in health econometrics can be applied to address what I'm going to call and define in a moment as endogeneity concerns. These endogeneity concerns are the aforementioned elephant in the room. Okay, and again, I'll come back to that in a moment as to why I see these as particularly problematic. And I want you to think about them, or at least I'm going to talk about them within the context of when we have an observational data set like the Growing Up in Ireland or like TILD or some sort of cross-sectional data set that's been gathered you know, for primary research purposes in order to, health, to, in order to inform health policy and health policy decision making. In a nutshell, it's going to boil down to a very, very simple idea that everybody in the room is familiar with, and it's that distinction between correlation and causation. And I'm going to make the sort of the very simple claim that ideally what we would like is to have causation. And there are dangers associated with looking at si simple statistical associations and correlations in order to inform health policy decision making. Okay, so we're going to talk about endogeneity. Again, my health. Uh, my, health, my econometric students are very familiar with the term. And what it means in a simple sense is whether or not when we estimate a statistical model, whether or not one of the variables or primary variable of interest is in some way um, endogenously determined within the framework that we're talking about. Okay, so I'll explain that um, with the use of an example. Essentially what we're trying to achieve when we do health econometric analysis is something called identification. The concept of understanding not necessarily what it is, is the statistical association or relationship between two variables, but much more importantly, what is the causal relationship that underpins the empirical regularities or the empirical results that we observe. So if we plot two data points against, or two variables against each other, and we observe some statistical association, what is driving that association? What is impacting or causing those results to be the way they are? The argument here basically is, that understanding that causality is essential for learning from empirical research. And it's a really, really important issue in, in health econometrics. There are a number of health economics journals which will only publish empirical studies if those empirical studies are actually identifying causal relationships as opposed to maybe presenting a descriptive analysis. Now, I'm not saying that the sorts of descriptive analyses that we're going to see in a moment are not useful in their own right. My argument essentially is going to be that for policymakers, when we and try to inform policymakers as to what they should do to address a specific problem that we seek to try and identify uh, causal effects. So the example I'm going to use to illustrate this idea of endogeneity is the Preston curve, which many of you may have seen before. Um, it's essentially the relationship between an individual's or a country's overall level of health, say for example as measured by life expectancy at birth on the, uh, the vertical y-axis and money as measured on the x-axis here in terms of something like GDP per person in US dollars in this particular case. And what this particular graphic shows us is for every country uh, in the world, what is the combination of health and, and money or income uh, in a given year 2010? So each of the dots represents um, an individual country. The size of the dot represents the population of the country. Um, the color coding represents the geographic area in which that particular country exists. And it's a nice graph from a number of, uh, for a number of reasons because we can, we, can, uh, we can have a number of observations associated with the data. And one of the things we can do is we can fit a line, a straight line, or probably more appropriately we can put a, um, a quadratic, a curve through that data, and we can trace out the relationship between health and income. And we'll obviously observe a strong positive correlation or association between health and income. Now, in a situation where you've got two variables like Y health and X income which are correlated, there can be three reasons for this which are not necessarily mutually exclusive. The first reason could be simply that changes in income drive changes in health. We've got what's called causality or direct causality. But it could also be the case that we have what's called reverse cause or reverse causation. 
It could be the case that changes in health are actually driving changes in income. And that's not as obvious to us, but there's a number of situations in which that could arise. It could be the case, say for example, in a developing country context, that actual health of an individual is important for their productivity on the farm, say for example, and directly impacts then, therefore, on their income. Or it could be the case that individuals' ill health in childhood impacts on their human capital accumulation, their education through childhood, and that has a knock-on impact later on in life in terms of their earnings. So we need to take into account that this possibility that you might have reverse cause in the relationship. And then most importantly, I'd argue, you also need to obviously take account of the fact that there are likely to be other factors which co-determine both income and health. So other variables, I'm going to label them here Z, such as education, and changes in education can be associated or drive changes in income, but also potentially in health. And if you just look at that simple relationship between income and health and come to a conclusion that changes in income drive changes in health without considering the three different possible reasons for that, what you're going to end up with is problems associated with endogeneity. You've got an endogeneity issue uh, in your analysis. That's going to lead you to come to, to make incorrect inferences in relation to the impact of changes in income on health. So my argument is a very simple one. It's number one that understanding this is very important in empirical research, but I think most people do understand that. Okay, so I don't think that that's going to be earth shattering news to many of us in the room. Um, but importantly, I think we really need to do more to address these issues in empirical research. I think it's essential for evidence based policy making. I think when we go to policy makers and say we found some evidence that X changes in X cause changes in Y, that's much more important than saying, you know something, this is interesting, what I found here is that X is correlated with Y. I don't think that's particularly useful or informative in terms of telling the policymaker what she should do to address a particular problem. And the broader context for this is, if you look at the range of research reports and a lot of the journal articles, we've seen huge increases in the number of journal article publications over the last sort of 10, 15, 20 years. And associated with that has been a proliferation of studies which look at determinants of some issue, correlates of some issue, predictors of some issue. And as I say, I don't mean to, to bash these particular studies. I do some of these types of studies myself. Um, but we need to be very careful how we take the results from these sorts of studies and use them and apply policy um, recommendations from them. We need to be very, very careful in terms of what the results from these sorts of studies actually mean in terms of what policymakers should do. So here's a cautionary tale from the New England Journal of Medicine. So this is a, a highly respected, highly esteemed journal which uh, Frank alluded to earlier this morning. It's the you know, the one with the highest impact factor is the one we all dream about getting that publication in. And here's a paper from the New England Journal of Medicine, I think it's 2012, by Franz Messerlis titled Chocolate Consumption, Cognitive Function and Nobel Laureates. And what Franz Messerly did in this paper is he started off with, um, with an idea um, or a statement that dietary flavonoids, which are often found in certain um, dark chocolates and other, and other, uh, and other um, foods um, have been associated with or lead to improved cognitive ability. So his thesis or his testable hypothesis was perhaps it's the case that countries who consume more of these dietary flavonoids through say for example, example chocolate consumption, maybe they have overall higher levels of cognitive ability or cognitive function than countries who consume less chocolate. A very simple research hypothesis one that can be tested using data. There are methods we can apply to do the hypothesis testing and reach a conclusion and perhaps even some policy recommendation. Now, Messerly didn't have data on, or appropriate data, he said, in relation to cognitive function at a country level, which was the unit of analysis at which the analysis was performed. So instead, what he did was he took a proxy measure for cognitive function at a country level and just calculated the number of Nobel laureates per head of population. And he produced this graphic, okay, which is quite striking. It shows on the x-axis chocolate consumption, kilograms per year per capita on the horizontal x-axis, and Nobel laureates per 10 million population on the y-axis. The data is plotted. He's even put these nice little flags in. Okay, a picture tell, you know, it really captures the attention. He sticks a straight line through the data. 
He considers the statistical relationship between these two variables. He looks at the correlation coefficient, the degree of linear association between the two variables. 0.791, wonderful. If we suspect, for example, that the Swedes, there's maybe a bit of hometown bias in the awarding of Nobel laureates. They're above the trend line, so maybe there's something fishy going on, so let's get rid of the Swedes, right? The correlation increases to something like 0.86. Really, really highly correlated variables. And what Messerly does is take the estimated relationship between these two variables and do the sorts of statistical analyses, dose response function estimates that are typically used in these sorts of cross-sectional observational studies, and I can't remember the exact, um, the, exact, uh, the exact amount, but the dose response was something like, we need to all eat an extra four kilograms of chocolate per year to increase the number of Nobel laureates by one. <laughs> Fascinating. So this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, as I said, 2012, and it caused consternation. Okay, people were in uproar. You can't do this, this is ridiculous. There's omitted variable bias. There's all sorts of other factors going on. And of course the whole thing was a bit of a spoof. Okay, it was a cautionary tale. It was a tongue in cheek article, which is quite amusing because you still see today people coming across this paper by accident and writing big blog posts about how outrageous this study is. But it was, it was tongue in cheek. But it was done to highlight the dangers associated with doing this sort of analysis and publishing the results. Because there was a policy prescription that arose from the empirical analysis. Now there was nothing wrong with the hypothesis as set up. There was nothing wrong with the data collection and even you could argue a little bit about the variables used. The statistical analysis was all fine, but it all broke down at the interpretation phase. Okay, and that's really the key point here. We need to be very careful about how it is we interpret these correlations. There's nothing else controlled for in this analysis, but even if you control for other variables, you're likely to still find some association. And the reason is you can't really control for everything in this sort of cross-sectional observational world. So, so that's a nice cautionary tale. But the paper that really got me thinking about this issue, or the, at least the, the newspaper article that really got me thinking about this issue, was one that I read over the summer. It was, um, it was a piece um, written in the New York Times uh, in their review of books, and it was a report on a, an academic journal article that was published in a, another really good um, academic journal, Social Science and Medicine, this time not a tongue-in-cheek article, a really nice piece of, of, of analysis, which looked at the relationship between the extent to which people read and their life expectancy. So from a population health point of view, policymakers might be interested to know, well, if we all read more books, that's really interesting if that increases our longevity, right? So you might think about a potential policy which says we need to have more public libraries, we need to try and shift you know, people's, people's leisure time from watching TV to reading books because this is gonna cause people to live longer. So the New York Times picked up on this article and they wrote a nice little piece interpreting the results of the, of the, of the, of the paper, and they, they frame it as read books live longer and a little bit of a question mark. So that question mark, stress, or it implies causality. It implies that if you do one thing, you're going, something else is gonna happen. And they start off with this really interesting line, I think, reading books is tied to a longer life, okay? The question is, how is it tied? Is it an association or does it cause you to live a longer life? And that, I think, is the issue in a nutshell. Because if you go to a policymaker and you say, I've done this study, I've done all this fancy statistical analysis or econometrics, but well, all I can show you is that it's tied to something, but it doesn't necessarily cause something, and the study doesn't identify causality, it just shows that the two are, are tied. What good is that to the policymaker who thinks, well, what should I do? Should I open all those new libraries? Should I do something else? And I don't think, I think those types of studies are useful in a certain context, but we have to be really careful in terms of making policy prescriptions from them. So that's the elephant in the room, okay? Um, what do we do to address the elephant? So fortunately, there's a, a range of different techniques that we can use to get what I call identification or identify these causal effects. And there's four broad approaches that are routinely used, not just in e economics and health economics, but other disciplines, and two of them are experimental and two of them are non-experimental. So the experimental ones you're all very uh, familiar with. They are you know, techniques like randomized controlled trials. We might have um, you know, natural field, or we might have field experiments, lab experiments, so on and so forth, where you generate the variation in your X variable and see what happens to your Y variable. You have a control and a treatment group and you identify the effect of changing X on Y. And that's sort of the gold standard in terms of identifying causality. 
If you're fortunate, you might have what's called a natural experiment. So some random exogenous policy change or some other event causes or generates variation in your variable of interest. And <laughs> so, so the reason my, my econometric students are laughing is for the last two weeks, I've had a lot of problems with projectors and it's happening again. I swear it's not me. <laughs> okay. uh, so hopefully we can get through this. Um, without a breakdown. So in this sort of situation, something causes random variation in your X variable and you can observe what happens to Y. And there's lovely statistical techniques then to sort of tease out the causal effect. But the important point here is one and two here are experimental designs, either direct or quasi experimental designs. We don't always have those sorts of setups in social sciences and health domains. But what we do often have is really good observational data where we can look at the data and see, can we use some other technique to identify or mimic the effect of, a natural exper or of an experiment, for example, where maybe we take some other variable which provides us with, with variation, which would be an instrumental variables approach, or can we do the sort of more old school econometric identification techniques? So what I want to suggest today is, when we do this sort of population health research that I was talking about at the beginning of the, of the talk, we need to move, I think, more from just doing, looking at the correlations and the associations to employing these sorts of techniques in order to try and get closer to uh, the identification of causal, causal effects. So let, five minutes. So let me just talk very briefly then about what these sorts of approaches entail and how we have used them um, to date in the Health Economics and Policy Analysis Centre here at NUI Galway. The first approach, which I think is increasingly commonly used in the health domain, is the instrumental variables approach. So this is a relatively technical approach, but I'll try and get it across to you in nice, simple terms in the space of two slides. But if you were interested, as we often are, in looking at, well, what is the causal effect of changing an X variable like education on some variable like health? If you were to look at the association between those two variables like we've done before, there's likely going to be important personal variables that you just can't observe. We can't observe our individual specific characteristics because we're all different. We have, you know, there are, there's individual heterogeneity in the population. And those sorts of characteristics are often correlated with the observed explanatory um, information, like our education and like our health. And if you estimate models of health as a function of education, you get what the economists call omitted variable bias and the medics will call confounding bias. So what do you do? Okay, in really, really simple terms, what you do is you look for some other variable Z called an instrument, which is a good predictor of your potentially endogenous policy variable, but which is uncorrelated with the other variables which you think you don't have information on, the missing or the unobserved term in your model. And if you have available to you this sort of instrument, what you can do is you can essentially predict a clean <laughs> version of the policy variable and use that then to identify the impact of changing the policy variable on your outcome one. Okay, so that's, that's, the, that's the approach in a, very, in a very sort of general overview and simplified way. And we've used this sort of approach in a number of studies. So here's one from, um, from, from this year that Paddy Gillespie and I um, have, have looked at. We've been interested in, um, in the issue or the, the, how, how subjective measures of health like self-rated health can be used within a clinical setting. We're interested in the validity of that, of that, of that variable. So one of the things we thought might be useful in terms of considering its validity was to see, well, to what extent is it associated with um, uh, overweight and obesity? So we were able to employ, in this, in this situation, we were able to employ a, an instrument for parental body mass index, index status using the body mass index of a, bi a biological child. And what we found was over, being overweight does not impact really in any way on your self-rated health, but being, over, but being obese does. And we were able to, to look at that in a little bit of detail. At a sort of more, maybe more policy relevant level, Adele Doherty, is, um, who's also with HEPAC, is leading a study that Paddy and I and Michelle Quigley are also involved in, where she's looking at the impact of childhood overweight and obesity on healthcare utilization. So this is a study, I think, which perfectly encapsulates the sorts of issues that, um, that I'm talking about uh, today. Because when she employs the instrumental variables approach, what she finds is that there's a large effect of body mass index on GP utilization and inpatient stays for kids. But if you estimate a model, a simple model, where you don't control for that endogeneity, 
you don't find any effect. For the policymaker, that's crucial because if you just look at the correlations, even controlling for other factors in the normal way, you won't find any effect of, of overweight and obesity on healthcare utilisation. Using these sorts of instrumental variables approach, controlling for that endogeneity, you find large impacts. And that's very important in the policy context if you're trying to justify increased expenditures on, on prevention programmes, say, for childhood overweight and obesity. Okay, so I've probably got two minutes. Okay, so I'm going to skip on and I'm going to say that there are other approaches that we can use, other econometric approaches that we can use, some of them a little bit fancier, some of them very fancy, um, but all of which will help us get a little bit further towards identifying these causal effects. And one of those methods that is routinely used in health economics and other areas are panel data methods. Now, the, the, the reason I bring this up is that some of the data that I mentioned earlier on at the start of my talk that we now have, have available to us growing up in Ireland and Tilda, for example, these data sets are longitudinal in that they follow the same individuals over time. So they have both cross-sectional and time series dimensions, and it means that there's a range of advantages um, associated with them over sort of simple cross-sectional observational data. In particular, you can control for what's called unobserved heterogeneity, these individual characteristics that we all have, um, which are really problematic when you're looking at cross-sectional data. So I've used them in a study here where I was able to identify the causal effect of having a disability on, uh, on cost of living with a disability. Without these sorts of panel data techniques, the model would likely um, suffer from endogeneity and you wouldn't have identified the causal impact of disability on costs. I'm doing another study at the moment where I'm looking at the causal impact of child disability on parental health. And again, I'm using longitudinal data, this time the Growing Up in Ireland survey data. And what I'm essentially able to do is exploit the fact that you've got transitions in and out of disability for children and for self-rated health for the parents. And I'm able to see, for example, identify that mothers of disabled children have almost twice as likely the, the probability of rating their health as poor. Okay, so very quickly to conclude, what I'd say is, in a nutshell, the take home here is that identification, this idea of understanding causality in empirical analysis is really essential for generating meaningful results for policymakers. It's not to say that the descriptive analyses are not in any way useful, they are, they're very important for identifying particularly problematic areas. Um, but I think we have to be very cautious in how we use them for, for policy prescription purposes. I think it's a particularly important issue when we have observational data. Having longitudinal observational data can go a large way to addressing some of these concerns. Um, and, but fortunately, we have this range of health econometric approaches um, which, um, you know, which can help us in that regard, but they must be carefully implemented. So before I finish up, I just want to, first of all, thank you very much for all of your attention. And the last thing I want to do is I want to return to the elephant in the room. So this is a picture of Banksy's elephant in the room. So since I started my, my talk with this, I thought it'd be a nice way to bookend. So thank you uh, all very much for your time.